Okay, welcome to the, the seventh video overall in the Marine Invertebrate Biology course. And this is the second video for the phylum Cnidaria. And we're starting off talking about feeding in Cnidarians. Uh, it lends itself to how the phylum gets its name. And it's one of the more interesting things about the Cnidarians. They're carnivores. That means that they're not just filtering particles out of the water like the sponges. They actually eat prey. And how do they get that prey? They use their tentacles to obtain zooplankton, uh, which means very generally small animals that are in the water. Some things can catch fish, uh, so they can catch some big, quite big things. Uh, and they also will uh, catch little suspended particles. And they do that by using stinging cells called nidocytes. We get my little pointer up here. We see this root word site again, which means a cell. So it is a stinging cell, individual cells that have organelles, which are organs within uh, a cell. They're not actually organs because they're not made up of multiple tissues, but they're, they're called organelles, which is a little structure within the cell that does a uh, function. And these things have barbed harpoons called nematocysts. Okay, and we see the root word cyst. So if you have a cyst growing on your body, then that means like a little compartment, a cyst. Uh, a zit would be a cyst. It's something that is a compartment that's filled. And these line up the tentacles. So the nematocysts are the organelles that are, that are within the nidocyte. Okay, let's have a look at how those work. Uh, and they pierce the skin of the prey. It's like a little, each little cell is like a small little spear gun. Uh, and it injects a stinging cord that also injects a lot of toxins and immobilizes and captures the prey. So this is an example of how it works. This is a diagram of a, a cutaway diagram of different cells with the nematocysts in different stages. So if we look at where I'm highlighting, you'll see that this whole area bounded is a nidocyte. That's the cell, nidocyte, C-Y-T-E, just from like the last slide. And inside the nidocyte is the organelle called the nematocyst. Okay, the nematocyst is not the cell. The nidocyte is the cell. The nematocyst is the organelle. So when the prey comes up close to the uh, surface of the tentacle, so you imagine that all of these cells are lined up. This right here is the, the skin, the tentacle skin of the uh, anemone or jellyfish and what happens is when there's a cue that this prey is close by this trap door opens up and uh, it's it's spring-loaded there's hydrostatic pressure so there's a lot of essentially like a water pressure that makes this um, this organelle is under pressure, and when this trap door is stimulated to open up, this little trap door at the, uh, at the surface of the organelle, then the little spear shoots out and unwinds, and so it pierces the skin of the prey, and then this coiled up rope right here, or this little thread that has, is absolutely covered in toxins, gets shot into the body of the prey and where all the toxins are released and that will kill or at least immobilize the prey which can then be ingested. Here is a micrograph of the or the nidocyte that has been fired. So this whole thing right here is the cell and the organelle was inside the organelle, the nematocyst, would have been inside there, and all of this 
was coiled up inside the cell. And notice all these little barbs. Okay, which way are they facing? They're facing backwards as this thing shut, shoots in. Here is the thread that is covered in toxins that would carry the toxins into the uh, into, into the body of the prey. But all of these uh, are the, in the part that shot through this prey's skin. And notice how, with those barbs facing backwards, how difficult it would be for the prey to get away. It's much like a barb on a fish hook. They will not be able to pull that pull that um, spear essentially out of their skin very easily. Here's another micrograph of a um, fired nematocyst uh, or a fired yeah a fired nematocyst within the nidocyte. So here is the nidocyte. It would go off of the the screen on this micrograph. A micrograph is just a uh, photograph of a microscope image. And you can see all the barbs here of the fired nematocyst. And here is a nidocyte that has not fired its nematocyst. And you can see the nematocyst coiled up within the cell. So what makes nidocytes fire their nematocysts? All right, so you might think uh, pressure. Uh, or you might think chemical cues, so the smell, essentially, of, fry, of the prey. So chemical cues and physical cues. Now, if every time something just pressed up against the anemone or the jellyfish tentacles, would it be smart for that, for that uh, animal to release all of its nidocytes and fire that into whatever pressed up against it? If you start thinking about this, you can't have just physical cues, just pressure against the uh, tentacle. Because if that happened, every time two tentacles of the same animal rubbed up against each other, it would be firing uh, nematocysts into itself, into other tentacles. And so it takes chemical cue, cues. There are chemical receptors on the tentacles which recognize prey versus self. Uh, and here are some nice pictures of something called box jellyfish stings. These are also known as irukandji, and they are, this is from Australia, and they can do some serious damage, even kill people. This is why if you live up in Queensland, there are a lot of places where you just can't swim because the box jellyfish uh, will, um, will take many lives each year. They actually take many lives each year. Here's another um, sting from uh, Irukandji from these box jellyfish and I think this person actually died. So how do uh, cnidarians reproduce? Um, well, I should say that the cnidocytes are what give the name to the cnidarians because all classes of cnidarians have stinging tentacles. Okay, asexual reproduction, they um, can do uh, reproduction asexually, going through the general characteristics of cnidarians, and here we see a budding off of a whole new organism, a whole new individual, uh, this one, off of the adult hydrozoan. And it may not be just a new benthic uh, individual, but it could even be a medusa that buds away. And here's another micrograph. You can see the um, these little areas with the stinging cnidocytes lined up on the edge of the tentacles. And But we could also see over here new individuals budding off quite a lot of them budding off of this um, adult, and those can become either part of an aggregation or a colony right near this uh, hydrozone, or it can become a whole new individual. So when they reproduce uh, sexually, 
So they will broadcast eggs or, or sperm, depending on which species. And these come together and form a planula larva, which is the same as in sponges. And you can see all these little cells, which act as like little paddles to make this thing mobile as it swims through the, uh, the water column. And this is another reason we use embryology to uh, look to try to establish relationships when we're looking at evolutionary pathways. And this is why we think that cnidarians evolved from sponges. The uh, two tissue or the two cell layers became more specialized from sponges and turned into tissues. And then we still see a planula larva in the cnidarians, uh, just like the sponges. So planula, they're microscopic, covered in tiny cilia, which we've talked about, and they will swim around, settle on a new sur surface, or they will just morph into a whole new uh, jellyfish if it's a um, if it's a planktonic organism. So that can either settle on the bottom, on the substrate, or it can turn into a jellyfish in the water column. So there are three classes that you will be responsible for. Has, okay, so it is hydrozoans, the anthozoans, and the scyphozoans. Okay, so these are three little bits of terminology that you'll need to uh, commit to memory. And again, we have the little flashcard symbol on the ones that have some terminology. And we will not be talking about the, this fourth class, the cubozoa, the box jellyfish, the irikanji, because uh, they're not common in New Zealand waters. But they are beautiful and beautiful, deadly little things. They're called a box jellyfish because they have only four little uh, attachments for uh, tentacles. So they're like a box. So let's talk about hydrozoans first. They are often mistaken for plants. Uh, as we were talking about before in the slideshow, they can be solitary, aggregated, or colonial. Solitary by themselves, aggregated individuals that uh, are in proximity to each other, near to each other, or colonial where they share the same home, uh, but they are individual little organisms. And they're almost exclusively benthic uh, as adults. They do have medusas in the certain dispersal phases. This is a uh, bit of hydrozoan fuzz. Here's a close-up of hydrozoan fuzz with this uh, isopod on it, which we'll, or sorry, uh, amphipod on it, which we will be talking about later on in the class. But these are hydrozoans, and this is one little uh, polyp. Here's another little polyp, another little polyp. This is a big colony of lots and lots of very small hydrozoan polyps. Uh, these are ones that you're, you'll be more familiar with as you dive. They're called tree hydrozoans. Uh, and this is another one, uh, beautiful one from um, inshore waters in, in coastal waters in New Zealand. And the stick hydrozoan, you'll find these in caves and uh, overhangs, dark areas. Uh, you'll find these, and they are actually quite beautiful. They look like a little flower. It's a colony of, of hydrozoans. Here's another picture of what they look like as, a, as, as an aggregation or on the back of a hermit crab. They can uh, use hermit crabs as dispersal or other organisms to carry them around to new uh, feeding grounds. And the other one, uh, which is another type of hydrozoan, which is considered planktonic, but uh, is the, or sorry, the uh, blue bottle, which um, many of you will have seen washed up on the beaches. And it has different types of polyps one is filled with air, and then a couple of other types of polyps that are attached to this polyp that's filled with air that acts like a, uh, a sail and also keeps the uh, animal up 
in at the top of the water column where it doesn't sink away to the bottom below which where all the, the food is. All the prey is up near the water, the surface and so that's where these things want to stay. Okay, this uh, video will get too long if I don't knock it on the head here. And this is the end of Nidaria 7.